Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for another monthly chat with Bishop Gaynor, where he sits down and answers your questions that have been submitted through the previous month. So, Bishop, thanks for joining us. You're welcome, Rachel. Glad to be back again with yeah. you. Excellent. Well, let's just jump right in. We have uh, several questions that were submitted this this time around. Uh, and then the first, the very first one is about the, the news that the diocese released on the obligation for to attend Mass being reinstated. Uh, so what does this mean for Catholics in the diocese? Good. Well, you might recall that uh, it was March of 2020 uh, when um, we put in place the dispensation from the the Sunday Mass obligation. And uh, the reason, of course, was that we, our, our churches were, were closing and the availability of Mass was uh, not there for the faithful. And, and so uh, the bishops of Pennsylvania, each in his own diocese, um, placed this dispensation so that the obligation was lifted from all faithful Catholics. Um, so now on the other side of the pandemic, um, we hope to see it continue to um, uh, regress, uh, then uh, it seems uh, right for us, the bishops of Pennsylvania, to reinstate the obligation um, because uh, people are uh, moving around more freely now. I think we've returned to more, a, a greater level of normalcy in our, our daily lives. And so it, there didn't seem to be a reason to keep the dispensation in place. And, and so as of the uh, Sunday, it happens to be, but the Feast of the Assumption of Our Blessed Mother, August the 15th, the obligation to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days will resume. So the dispensation is being lifted. It might, might be helped to just remember where that obligation comes from. You know, first of all, it's a divine law. Uh, one of the Ten Commandments, the Third Commandment, is uh, to remember to keep holy the Sabbath. And of course, for the uh, the context of the commandments, that would be Saturday was the Sabbath, but for us, the Sabbath is Sunday, uh, the day of the resurrection. And so the church has specified um, that third commandment in one of its precepts. We have the five precepts of the Catholic Church, and the first one is the obligation to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days. So we've taken that third commandment of the Decalogue and then specified it by saying for the Catholic, uh, the way of keep holy the Sabbath or the Lord's Day is by uh, participating in the uh, greatest prayer that we can offer to God uh, by entering into the sacred liturgy and, and, the, and the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection in the Eucharist. And, and so that's the, the first of the five precepts of, of the church. So that's where the obligation comes from. It's really a divine law made specific through church law. And uh, as of August the 15th, it just seems reasonable and, uh, and appropriate that we uh, gather the faithful again in person in our churches for the celebration of the Mass. It's been wonderful, and I hope that most of our parishes will continue, if not all of our parishes, to live stream uh, their Masses, at least one Mass, for, for the people who are shut-ins, who are homebound, who are or taking care of uh, the homebound, uh, so that they might see their parish church, their pastor, or a priest at their parish offering the Mass. But uh, there's no substitute for the faithful coming together in person to be physically present and to enter into the mystery uh, of the Eucharist uh, on the Lord's Day and on Holy Days of Obligation. Okay. Now there is still a a, a semi dispensation in place for those who are uh, ill, correct? Indeed, indeed. And that's always been that's n nothing new. The uh, the obligation ceases when there are uh, mitigating factors. So, for instance, someone is sick at home and can't possibly then it, it's not. Uh, and I know oftentimes in confession, someone will say, "I missed mass," and I would say, "Well, you usually come." Well, yes, but I was so sick I couldn't get out of bed. Well. When that happens, you're, we are dispensed. The church, um, the legislator uh, can't foresee every individual situation. And so there is a, a dispensation or the obligation ceases when it's impossible to fulfill. So that would cover someone who um, is, is sick temporarily or who is in a situation where they are homebound permanently. Uh, someone who takes care of them. Someone who's receiving a therapy where immunity is suppressed and it's not good to come around crowds, and they, they need to be very careful. Uh, so those, those folks would be uh, dispensed just automatically um, through uh, the, the church's um, 
generous mercy and Christ's mercy. So that, but the caretakers who, who take care of those folks. So yeah, they're, they're, even though the obligation will be reinstated, there, there can be many situations in which the faithful are still dispensed. Okay, excellent, all right. So we have a question now that was submitted from Richard. And uh, Richard would like to know, just kind of generally, what is the status of Catholic schools in the diocese uh, especially regarding the risk of further consolidations or, or closures. And then as a follow-up, what are the challenges and opportunities regarding Catholic education in our diocese? Well, Richard's question is a very timely one uh, because we have launched uh, rather recently um, a plan for a strategic vision for our schools. In our diocese, as has been the national trend uh, over the last two decades at least and more, we've seen a downturn in uh, registration, uh, enrollment, and in the existence of, of Catholic schools. And since I'm Bishop here, several schools uh, had to be closed. And uh, our plan is, is to stop that and to reverse it. I, I am a product of many years of Catholic education, grade school, high school, seminary, and, and post-graduate uh, work. Uh, and I, I value that, and I want it to be readily accessible to the families of our diocese. So uh, we're partnering with the National Catholic Education Association. I say we, I mean our, our Secretary for Catholic Schools, Mr. Dan Breen, and his staff here at the diocese, uh, as well as all of our stakeholders are involved in this process. We're calling it Christ Before Me uh, as the name of this uh, strategic vision that's going to be developed. Um, and that's, that is taken uh, a phrase from the, what's called St. Patrick's Breastplate or the Lorica, uh, because St. Patrick is the patron of our diocese. But it, it expresses, I think, the heart of the vision. And that is we have to keep Christ before our eyes as we try to uh, make our Catholic schools and Catholic education as vibrant uh, and dynamic uh, as possible here in, in the diocese. So I have a great hope as, as this process moves forward that we will have a plan for the viability and, and the vitality of our Catholic schools. Um, we, we have um, 30 elementary schools at the moment and six high schools, and I want to see them grow. We want to see the enrollments increase. That, the great challenge is exactly that. Uh, Richard asked about the challenge. It's to... Uh, uh, get get students into our schools and um, th the opportunities we have of course is that 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 phrase Christ before me uh, is that we, we want our schools to be academically excellent we want all of the programs that help body mind and soul to be the, the best possible that we can offer but at the same time the, the overarching purpose of our Catholic schools is to form disciples for Christ you know, we want our students, our graduates, to be successful in this life, but always to be aware that they're headed for another life, for eternal life. Mm -hmm. And success in that life, uh, reaching success in the glory of heaven, is, is the most important uh, goal of each of our lives. Uh, for opportunities, I think what, what we need to be aware of and continue to work on is finding ways to assist our families to afford uh, Catholic education. We have, we're have we very fortunate in Pennsylvania with the tax credit programs that we have, both the business and individual. Um, we have some very generous folks who, who uh, uh, themselves will adopt children and, and pay, their, you know, pay the, pri the uh, cost of their uh, tuition expenses. Uh, but that's an area I think we always need to work on. And, and part of our plan will be to do just that, to, to do our very best to make more and more financial assistance available uh, by way of uh, tuition assistance uh, for our families so that they can choose Catholic schools, especially those who find it just a little a little too pricey. Uh, the fact is here in our diocese and basically in Pennsylvania, our, our tuition charges are, are very low uh, compared to many other places for Catholic schools. But nevertheless, they represent a financial challenge to many families. And I hope we can uh, help to alleviate that. So at presently, there there are no schools that are might say on the chopping block or that uh, we're, we're, we're worried, uh, you know, that, that, that may be closing in the near future. But we need to work hard because it is an uphill battle. But I mean, we want to certainly change that trend 
uh, where we've seen th the downturn in enrollment and the closing of our schools. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to try to do everything we can to uh, turn that around. Excellent. Thank you, Bishop. Sure. Uh, so uh, another question that we have is uh, on marriage and what makes a marriage a valid marriage? And then are there some things that could make a, val a marriage invalid, uh, which could be cause for a declaration of nullity? Well, I, I could go on and on on this question because <laughs> it's an area of my ministry that I worked in uh, for many years prior to becoming a bishop. Um, and, and so let's say what makes a marriage valid? It, uh, I would describe it this way, one man and one woman who are free to marry, who give valid consent in the Catholic form for marriage. So those, those are the elements. So one man and one woman. That There's a, a, a biological man at birth and a biological woman at birth. So, uh, so one man and one woman who are free to marry. Uh, someone may have a, an existing form of marriage. They might have been divorced, but divorce does not sever the nuptial bond as far as our church is concerned. And um, it tells us that a marriage died, but it doesn't tell us anything about the bond of marriage. So uh, they have to be free to be able to marry. They have to be able to give valid consent. And that means uh, I have to be able to knowingly and willingly uh, pledge the rest of my life to you as, a, as my spouse in a faithful, fruitful, and permanent uh, union. Um, and it must be done in the context of the Catholic form of marriage, which is a properly delegated minister uh, before two witnesses. So, so what could make a marriage invalid? Um, let's just look at two aspects because it, it's, it is a, a rather involved topic. But that Catholic form of marriage and probably the most frequent form of an annulment or a, de a declaration that this marriage was not valid is due to a lack of Catholic form. Mm. Someone, a Catholic, uh, marries another Catholic or anyone else. Both of them are free to marry. Both of them are capable of consent, um, but they marry before uh, a minister of another denomination or they marry before a, um, a, a justice of the peace, mm. uh, the captain of a ship, whatever it would have you. That, that is a, 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 an attempted marriage which lacks Catholic form. So uh, that would be declared by what's called an administrative procedure. We just have to say, well, here's how they married. They were obligated to, at least one of them obligated to the Catholic form, and they didn't observe it. So it's, it's, it's a defect of form or a total absence, a lack of form uh, for the marriage. So that's an easy way of declaring uh, a, a marriage that has now failed um, to be null. Okay. Another, and again, the common way is a full formal trial of nullity that focuses on that area that I said they have to be capable of valid consent. And there are many factors that could invalidate my consent. Um, one of the most common ones is that uh, while I have good intentions, I have uh, feelings of love for this uh, woman that I'm going to marry. But after I enter into marriage life, I find that I'm not able to deliver uh, what marriage requires. I have a lack of, the lack of due competence to fulfill the requirements of a nuptial union. Mm -hmm. And I may not know that, this isn't deliberate, but the stress of uh, a marriage, maybe raising uh, children, uh, all of a sudden brings out certain defects that preexisted the day of the wedding, but were maybe even unknown. But I'm not able to deliver what marriage requires of me. And, and that would be a defective consent. So when we're looking at a formal trial of nullity, there's only one uh, reason that that marriage could be invalid. That there's a canon that says consent makes the marriage. Okay. So the free, willing, knowing consent on the part of the parties makes the marriage. So the only way a marriage could be invalid when it's properly celebrated in the Catholic form between a man and a woman um, is that there's a defect of consent. And there are many, many uh, ways in which that consent could, I, I could actually be lying. I, you know, I, 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 I could stand there on the day of my wedding and I have 
having dealt with several thousand marriage cases, uh, this may sound preposterous, but in fact, it's real life. And that is have a girlfriend that my, my uh, spouse doesn't know about, call her on our wedding night, call her during the honeymoon, and then be with her uh, when we return home. Uh, that person deceived his spouse, his, his wife, uh, on the day of the wedding, so, so that um, the, 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 the uh, consent given was invalid by deception. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he did not intend a faithful union with his wife. So that, that's, it's fairly rare, but certainly not impossible. But those are, that's some, I hope that, that helps. But um, what a beautiful sacrament this is. And, and thank God we have so many uh, of our faithful who, uh, despite the struggles and the challenges by God's grace and their own determination, live such beautiful lives uh, in, in this sacrament. We just had recently the 50th wedding anniversary uh, and that's one of the highlights for me in the life of the diocese each year when we celebrate those couples celebrating that when we honor those couples celebrating their their golden wedding anniversary excellent thank you i'm, I'm sure that will be a, a a big help for those who are wondering um, about marriage mm -hmm. so now the last question we have um, for this month is uh that uh, you know sometimes we've heard the phrase baptismal dignity um but but what what is that? What, what is baptismal dignity? That, that's, a, that's a good question because we do use it uh, freely and it, it emphasizes the, um, the, the beauty of that first sacrament of initiation. I think we might begin by saying, of course, that at the moment of conception, uh, human life uh, has dignity. You know, there, there is a sacredness because human life is made in the image and likeness of God. We're created in the image of God. And so every human life has a sacredness, has a dignity because of that image of God being imprinted on our soul from the moment of conception. Um, but baptismal dignity refers to the rebirth that happens to us in the sacrament of baptism when having been born into the human family, uh, we're now born into the family of God um, through the waters of, of baptism. And uh, the Paschal mystery takes hold of our lives such that we uh, die and rise to new life with Christ. And we begin to share the very life of God, the life of sanctifying grace, the, the life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is infused as the water is poured outside on the person, the baby usually, um, the, the sanctifying grace, the life of God is being poured inside uh, that child, uh, in, inside of us at the moment of baptism. And, and we begin to belong to the people of God. We belong to the, the body of Christ, his mystical body, the church. And, and so um, I, I think all of those, that, that those effects of the sacrament of, of baptism, um, this rebirth, into the very life of God and membership into Christ's body is all part of what we mean by we saying we, that uh, the baptismal dignity uh, of us. So it, it's, it's uh, in addition to being made in the image of God, when one is baptized, one begins to live with the very life of God. A, a new, we're reborn uh, into a new life, which has been made possible for us through the death and resurrection of Christ. All right, thank you, Bishop. That that definitely helps. Uh, so that's all the questions we have okay. for for this month. So again, we thank you for joining us. I know you're you're very busy and you're very generous with your time with stopping well, by. It's once a pleasure, a month. and I hope I hope it's a help to our uh, viewers. Oh, I'm I'm sure it is. Well, if you would like to submit a question for Bishop Gaynor for a future sit down chat with him, you can drop it in the comments here on Facebook, or you can email it to us at communications at hbg diocese. Dot .org. Well, from all of us here at the Diocese of Harrisburg, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.